Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the CG campus and to our event today. My name's Natalie Lacey. I'm the Director of Public Affairs here at CG. I wanted to welcome everyone who's on the Zoom meeting. I will be hosting that meeting through this event and will be directing questions that come in through the platform. At this point, we are ready to get started with our compelling discussion and the Q&A. So I would like to invite Paul Samsung and Ann Fitzgerald to the stage. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Fantastic to see so many people in this room and the energy that's here. And those of you that are here, we're obviously quick off the mark on I'm going and I'm going to be there in person. But we can promise you that those of you who are online, things are in very good shape here and you're going to get a great show. So I'm Paul Sampson, president of CG. Uh, I do want to start with a land acknowledgement that the CG campus is situated on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Abishinaabeg, and the neutral peoples. Uh, and today, we extend our profound respect and gratitude for their enduring wisdom and stewardship as guardians of these territories. CG is an independent, nonpartisan think tank that provides trusted analysis to help global and national policymakers to innovate. We are over 100 people around the world with our headquarters in this building, and the focus of our work is on the intersection of transformative technologies and governance. This includes security, social, and economic domains. The last thing that I'll say is that probably everyone would agree in this room and online that new approaches to technology and governance have never been more pressing to ensure healthy societies and democracy. Uh, and chatbots aren't the right place to go for answers. <laughs> Warm welcome to everybody today. My name is Anne Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Balsillie School of International Affairs. Uh, we're thrilled, delighted, and honored to be welcoming these two very, very special guests today, and just as thrilled, delighted, and honored to have all of you here in the room, and those of our guests, a huge number, online with us today. Let me start by just telling you a couple of things about the Balsillie School of International Affairs. There's lots I could say, but uh, in the interest of time, I want to just say how we take great pride on being situated here hip to hip with CG, one of our four collaborative framework partners together with the University of Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurier University in the center of the Waterloo region in the center of the intellectual square mile of some of Waterloo and uh, the, the wider region's finest intellectual institutions. That enables a great level of agility for a school of international affairs and public policy to bring constellations of expertise together across the uh, multitude of disciplines, be they social sciences, humanities, or STEM subjects. And so we bring an enormous amount of intellectual multilingualism to some of humanity's critical problems. And we're very proud of our faculty, our students, and our wider institutional community and partners in bringing policy impact research to those problems. Fantastic. So I'm going to briefly introduce our two key guests here. And I feel like you don't need a lot of introduction. But I will nevertheless say a couple of things. Shoshana Zuboff is an author, professor, uh, social psychologist, philosopher, and scholar. She is the author of several books, including the one you probably know best, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. She is a professor emerita at the Harvard Business School and a former associate at the Berkman Klein Center of Internet and Society at the Harvard Law School, amongst many other things that she's doing. Now, the next uh, special guest here, I feel like he really doesn't need an introduction in this room. And if he does, maybe you don't know him, we should suggest you're in the wrong room. But I will nevertheless um, say a couple of words about Jim Balsillie. And um, you know, he's clearly one of the leading entrepreneurs, innovators, investors, and policy minds in Canada and, and globally. He sits on several public sector boards. 
He is a founder of CG, the Balsili School of International Affairs, and more recently, the Council of Canadian Innovators, and he is really, really active in many spaces. So we're delighted to have both of them with us here today. Just a final word on the order of events today. We will start by welcoming our special guests. We will continue the conversation for about 50 minutes, then open the floor up to questions. We have microphones on the ends of both the staircases, and we will also take questions from our online guests. We will try to finish the event promptly at 5.30, after which we will welcome all of you to a small reception in our lobby where uh, Professor Zuboff's book will also be on sale and where she will be available for signing. So without further ado, a warm welcome to our special guests, Professor Shoshana Zuboff and Mr. Jim Balsili. All right, so we're gonna jump right into it, and um, we've, we've warmed up a little bit, but I'm just gonna shoot in right with a, a straight question to um, Shoshana, and that is, what is surveillance capitalism? Okay, um, I feel like I'm in a game show, and I just lucked <laughs> out, because I got, I got a question that I actually know the answer to. <laughs> All right. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for coming today. If I do this, I can actually see you for a moment, which really helps me. Uh, and and um, yeah, this is this is fantastic. All right. What is surveillance capitalism? Well, some people might think that surveillance capitalism is a phrase I put together um, to draw attention to the book cover, um, kind of melodramatic, but that really was never the point. The idea here is that um, capitalism uh, married to a form and function that cannot succeed without the social relations and infrastructures of surveillance. So it is absolutely essential to the uh, capacity for wealth creation of this form of capitalism, that it be conducted in the shadows. So let me ratchet back from that and explain exactly what I'm talking about. I'm gonna start with the origin story and then fast forward to where we are now. That sound okay? You like a good story? <laughs> All right. Because uh, we're back in Silicon Valley. The year is 2000. Um, in 2000, it's interesting to note that 25%, which is to say only 25% of the world's information was digitally stored. Now, that's going to be important um, in a few minutes. And if I forget to come back to it, you could shout that out at me. Hey, Shoshana, what about that 25%? And then I'll remember to connect those dots, OK? So here we are in Silicon Valley. We've got um, you know, several search engines that are competing for people's attention. And uh, one, uh, the new kid on the block, is considered the best search engine of all brought to us by a couple of young geniuses from Stanford, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. And um, they're tooling along. They have a lot of ideas about how they're going to uh, actually make money with this search engine. And then there's something called the dot-com bust. Most of you are too, no. OK. No. OK. I, I see more clearly now. Yeah, no, a lot of you will recall the dot-com bust. Am I right? OK. So then there's the dot-com bust. And um, this is really a big deal because uh, from the point of view of their little offices in Silicon Valley, they saw all their friends and colleagues going down. And it's, you may not know this, but um, Larry Page had an obsessive identification with the uh, scientist, Tesla, not the car. Um, 
because Tesla was a genius who died uh, in poverty. And he had a morbid fear of that ending up being his biography. And uh, Sergey Brin went on record uh, saying, this is the only reason I can quote him, because I wasn't there, but he went on record saying, uh, I don't want to go down as just another schmuck from Silicon Valley who had a business but couldn't make any money. So these two young men were highly motivated in the teeth of financial emergency to find a way to make money with their data. And then two things happened. One was they stumbled into a discovery. And that discovery was that every time anybody brushes by anything that's connected to the internet, they leave behind behavioral traces. And those behavioral traces, it turns out, and they understood this from the beginning, are highly predictive of their next behavioral moves. All right, so you've heard of these phrases like data exhaust, digital breadcrumbs, digital exhaust. That's what I'm talking about. But those phrases didn't exist yet. That came later. This was an original discovery that they made at Google, as I said, in the heat of emergency crisis. All right, with that discovery quickly emerged a new idea, a big new idea. And that idea was that using these traces for predicting behavior could become the next era of commodification. Predictions of human behavior could be packaged and sold like commodities, exactly the way we sell barrels of oil or tons of wheat, any other commodity you can think of. Human-generated data and the predictions they enable would be the next chapter of capitalism because it offered a door into the next era of commodification. Are you with me? Are you with me? OK. All right. You've heard of the click-through rate. How do you commodify this prediction stuff right away? Well, they had an advertising department at Little Google. But they all were very snooty about advertising. They thought it was, you know, like adver advertising is sort of low class activity. It's amazing what a crisis will do to get you to change your ideas about something like that. Because they suddenly saw that of all the people on Earth, probably some of the people who most want to be able to predict behavior are advertisers. But how are they advertising? They're still like, picking out key words that people search on and putting their ads there. Very primitive stuff compared to what Google was about to invent, which was the click-through rate, where we can now um, tell advertisers, you are no longer going to choose where your ads go. We have a black box. Anybody ever read the restaurant at the end of the universe? Nobody? Oh, wow. OK, I guess it's gone out of fashion. But uh, I really recommend it, because uh, then this becomes even more lively uh, when you picture some of the things in that book. But anyway, um, now Google would have a black box, and the advertisers would come and, and say to the black box, OK, where do I put my ad? The black box would spit out the answer, and uh, the rest is history. Between. 2001 when they started applying this, and 2004 when Google went public, nobody knew, nobody knew except a few people inside of Google. Even their investors did not know. Between that, that in that short span of time, their revenue line increased by 5,390%. They started with not being able to monetize data. 
Okay? So that's the capitalism. Surveillance capitalism, I just told you about the capitalism. Now, why surveillance? Why surveillance capitalism? All of those traces, turns out those traces, when you put them together with new forms of analysis, which even then they called our AI, you put those traces together and you can start to build inferences. And it turns out that those inferences reliably reveal intimate facts about people, sexual, political orientation, on and on and on, that those individuals themselves never intended to disclose. But through capturing the traces, their exclusive access to that, and through their exclusive access to the analysis that can turn them into predictions and insights, Google now had um, unprecedented knowledge about its users as individuals and in larger patterns of communities, societies, populations. It is fair to say that they understood right from the start that what they were doing was taking something from people without their knowledge and therefore clearly without their consent, using it for their own commercial advantage and against the interests of those very users. Any child will tell you when you take something from someone without their permission and knowledge and you use it for yourself against them, that's called Thank you. <laughs> Stealing. It's not a difficult concept. <laughs> In most walks of life, we call that criminal activity. And they understood right from the start that should users get any inkling of how this thing actually worked behind the curtain of the Wizard of Oz, that users would be repulsed, they would be revolted, they would rebel and withdraw. And in all of that noise, lawmakers' attention would be drawn to these activities and it would be the lawmakers who would say, hold on a second, this is stealing. You're under arrest. All right, so from the start, they understood that they could only be successful if they conducted this new, unprecedented business in the shadows. Only in the shadows could this thing grow, evolve, expand, and produce that incredible jump in revenue. Are you with me? Yes? yes? yes. All right. What they did was, here we are entering the digital century, and we're carrying with us a self-understanding that says, hey, intimate knowledge about me? That's something that is inalienable to me. An elemental right. I'm the one who decides with whom, if anyone, I share this knowledge and to what purpose. We assumed it was an inalienable right because we had no idea about traces. We had no idea about what their even fledgling AI could do with those traces. But they knew. And essentially what they did was they took our elemental privacy rights, and I'm using the word elemental because in many cases, as in my country, those rights were not codified in law. And even still they aren't, and we can talk about why that is later. What Google did right from the start was to take these 
elemental, inalienable, we thought, privacy rights. They didn't exactly destroy them. What they did was they stole them. They transferred those rights from the domain of individual citizens and communities to the domain of the corporation. They worked in the shadows. They had something that from the executive level down was called within the company the hiding strategy. They were not allowed to disclose to anyone what they were doing. They had all the privacy at the end of this operation. And we had none. Now, a lot of people, and probably a lot of people in this room, are still talking about privacy. We're still talking about privacy protection. We're still talking about data protection. We're still talking about privacy rights. And we're, and, and we, and we're passionate about it, committed to it. But there is an inconvenient truth, the elephant in the room. There is no more privacy. Privacy as we knew it in the year 2000, that year when, hey, nobody reminded me, 25% only of information was digitally stored, that privacy no longer exists. It has not existed for quite a while. What we have now, by the year 2013, we went from 20, okay, 80, in 1986 it was 1%. 1986 to 2000, it was 25%. From 2000 to 2013, 100%. What made the difference? Surveillance capitalism is what made the difference. The massive scale extraction of human generated data, <coughs> ubiquitous, inescapable, for profit. That's the origin story of surveillance capitalism. The final thing I want to say, just to bring it forward to the future, we began the story in Silicon Valley. We began the story in the United States. Today, surveillance capitalism has become the dominant economic paradigm across every sector, in every industry. Some of you may have seen recently, because I know many of you are immersed in this subject, Mozilla research that was published last month. 25 top global automobile brands. Every single one of them has shifted from making their margins on selling vehicles to using the vehicle as a loss leader for the data they can collect from your engagement with their vehicle and everything they can do with those data. That's where the margins come from now. Surveillance capitalism has redefined education, healthcare, finance, real estate. There is no industry that has escaped this structural shift. Surveillance capitalism is now a global institutional order, fully entrenched not only in our economy, but now, and we'll talk about this later, and this will be the final thing I say, so powerful that it has the audacity and the confidence to go head to head with democratic governance, de democratic governments over who will control the future of knowledge, the future of society, and the future of our information civilization. That's where we are right now. Well, Sim, maybe I can flip to you now and ask, um, you bring a very unique lens to this era where, in which surveillance capitalism is a dominant theme. The lens you bring, in my view, is a very unique combination of entrepreneurialism and policy work. So what are the key issues in your mind that need to be addressed? Well, thank you, Anne. And um, maybe I'll, I'll give a bit of a continuum on it because I came into this naturally in that uh, as we were growing RIM globally, uh, I kept cascading into these marketplace frameworks of state security, intellectual property, 
and other forms of data privacy rights. And so I quickly learned that we have a, my training as an economic specialist and, um, and how the business policy orthodoxy was domestically did not jive with my experience internationally. In a sense, we had two types of systems going on. One, uh, traditional or sort of emerging neoliberalism to liberalize markets, capital, and, and labor uh, to trade on comparative advantage. And then you just get rid of border adjustments or tariffs and uh, allow national treatment for investments. And the rising tide raises all boats. And then I was encountering this other force of marketplace frameworks, which are principles of restriction that work exactly opposite that. And that this is a two-legged race, not a one-legged race. And our policy orthodoxy was one of one-legged. We lamented our low productivity. And uh, I said, and, and, and when I encountered the domestic uh, policy folks, they're saying, we do this so right. Why isn't it working out? And they say, well, it must be false myths or resource curse. And I said, well, we're hopping when everyone else is running. And they were having none of what I was saying. And I'm, I'm going, I'm hitting this front row in the world. And, and very fortunately, I had good mentors in the US and, and, and we engaged in this framework. And, and that was my engagement in these frameworks and in innovation policy and aspects of the global governance roll forward, and I'm going to roll forward into Shoshana's stuff in a, a minute. Uh, ben Ki-moon asked me to sit on the UN High Panel for Sustainability, and we wrote uh, for uh, Rio Plus 20. I was the private sector representative, and I saw firsthand how these frameworks of enclosing knowledge through intellectual property were creating haves and have-nots in clean tech, and, uh, and that this was supposed to be a common good yet there were gonna be massive winners and massive losers. And there's this whole narrative of the diffusion of technology, which is gonna rising tide, is gonna raise all boats. But in fact, it was manufacturing inequality within states and between states. And that you're supposed to sacrifice for the common good, but some people are getting really rich on the common good and some are getting poor. And I could see the collision of these structures. And was, and we wrote the chapter on reforming economics as part of a group here, it's all good fun. And, and, and that was my advocacy. And, and then I started to see data as an asset, was emerging. Uh, I thought it was relatively just an economic lens in, in, a, mm -hmm. in, a, in a fairly, it was a factor of economic production uh, and it needs to be considered. And, and so that was kind of the world of, of ag advocacy. And then there was this rapid fire of things going on where, uh, I mean, in what I do, I read and draft contracts, so I can go through them very quickly. They had this Trans-Pacific Partnership. I was reading the draft of it, and I was, this was all about capturing regulatory frameworks for data and for IP, and I started to comment on that, and there was a cascading of the neoliberals you know, they're open-minded, I'm North Korea. And I'm saying, that's not what the words say. Uh, this is regulatory remote control. And then, of course, you had Shoshana's prescient book. You had what happened in Cambridge Analytica with the manipula manipulation there. You had the Trump election. And I'm beavering away on an economic lane, uh, on frameworks. Uh, uphill, domestically, sure. Consistent with norms around the world, but that's our, my reality. And, and then we had this um, emergence where three levels of government agreed with, with, a, with a, a supporting memo from our Privy Council office, agreed with Google to privatize the government of our largest city. And, and my jaw just dropped. And um, I thought this was an absurd self-emoliation, self-colonization. They take great offense when I say it. It just happens to be true. And so um, I, years after Shoshana's prescience, saw the cascading, cross-cutting nature of these things, that this cross-cut not only into security, but a cross-cut into social. And I saw the enormous degree of regulatory capture and gaslighting at hand. Um, 
my trust of the policy community went from low to lower. Uh, but I had this magical experience where I became this, I had this relationship with civil society which stood up and, and faced it down and, and the impossibility of all this. And, and through this process, I got reconnected with my graduate school professor, Zuboff. How have you been? And uh, it's been a few decades. And, very young uh, professor. Very young professor. <laughs> she was younger than me at the time. And, uh, uh, and then and Roger McNamee, and we were on the great. I was younger than you? At the oh, time? yeah. Yeah, we were. So that you, means I'm still younger than you're you? You're a prodigy. You're a prodigy. <laughs> I'm younger than, all right. <laughs> and I look young I like for my it. age. And I'm uh, um, back to yeah, I'm, I'm 80. Yeah. But the. Uh, um, but the uh, um, uh, and, and I saw, yeah, and I saw the nature of this force and we served on the Grand Committee together with Roger McNamee. You, you were very helpful in characterizing Sidewalk Labs uh, as the front line of surveillance capitalism globally. And I saw the absolutely critical role of civil society in this era. Mm. Without it, there was no chance Sidewalk would have been turned back. And, and so that was kind of my journey on this. And then if, as you, and of course, we've been engaged in lots of things in that and we're, and you know, we can go on that. But then you fast forward to today. So that was kind of the journey of why, how I started in an, a knowledge enclosure lane of, of uh, intellectual property, which by the way, 75% of all the 1.6 million patents last year are software. So they're also enclosing the knowledge of the production compute capacity that goes with this business model, which is a monopolizing structure. Um, very, very important. So don't ignore the knowledge enclosure with the data business model. They play hand in a hand and reinforce. A and then you fast, we come forward to today and we've had legislation and it was announced the same day with the business council and the industry minister, the support for the previous C27, C11. None of us saw it coming. And, and this was a, a pure case of gaslighting and regulatory capture. Um, I, interestingly, with what Shoshana is characterizing for managing AI and data, it's called a Consumer Protection Act. You're not citizens anymore. This is not a Citizen Protection Act. This is a Consumer Protection Act. You're just a consumer. And Many of you in this room I know have walked this journey. They refuse to put rights into it. Because once you go to rights, you're getting at the upstream thing. It's, it's, they like whack-a-mole better than they like rights. Because that's all, and the gaslighting, regulatory capture, whack-a-mole, wordsmithing, with a nice PR conference, your press conference, you can get away with it. And, and I, I saw this akin to the, the sidewalk. Uh, structure. So I believe in innovation. I believe in capitalism. I believe in human potential and ingenuity, but I don't believe in this. And so that's been my journey on the frameworks. That's how we've reconnected. That's, I think, what brought us here today. Um, and and I, I think, and I do know, particularly in the national scheme with the current C27 and Artificial Act, I know very directly that the corporate actors that helped draft it are trying to rush it through because they know this is the last chance to get something really weak through because it won't be addressed again in 10 or 15, 20 years. And they're afraid that if this gets slowed down, they'll actually have to do it with civil society involved. Right. So, so anyway, that's kind of how, you know, the frameworks are kind of, they're, they're not everything, but they're almost everything. And the governance of that and the civil society of it and, and the, the, the constructive response are, are critical. And, and, and uh, that's why I pay attention to it. I think it's our prosperity, it's our security, it's our society, it's our norms, it's our rights, it's our democracy, it's the health of the children, the, it, it's, it's human agency. Um, it's a bad bargain. And plus, for Canada, it's a bad bargain. You get all the downside and I don't even see the corporations where you get the tax base and some economy and wealth effects for it. So, so, I mean, I don't agree with the bargain in other countries, but it's a particularly bad bargain here. And yet it's being steamrolled by our, our elected uh, representatives federally. So yeah, that's, that's how I come at it. I, 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 I'm dangerous because I know it. I can read agreements. I've been in, I can't be dismissed as a non-commercial uh, protagonist mm -hmm. who's just being 
pie in the sky. And so that's, and I, and I love the people I've gotten to meet and work with on that. And I, I never expected that direction of my life. And there you go. Here you are. Thank you very much. Yeah. Follow your principles. Go on a journey. So go get them. <laughs> very complimentary um, comments on a similar conceptual thread. Let's stick with that a little bit further. And Shoshana, you hinted to it a moment ago, and you've alluded to it or stated it in a couple of recent articles of this, this idea of, of surveillance capitalism and democracy locking horns in a, in a death struggle. You know? and, and so can you say a little bit more about the context of that and what's, what's at stake with that, that death struggle that's underway? So, uh... We talked a moment ago about this transfer of privacy from people to the corporations. That was the foundation. Without that transfer, this massive scale extraction of human generated data operation couldn't have worked. But that was the foundation. And what's been built on that foundation? All right, what I've tried to do in my work uh, most recently is to show how surveillance capitalism has grown not just as an economic logic, but as an institutional order. It turns out that when the thing you're commodifying is not oil, is not wheat, but is humanity itself. We fly pretty quickly out of the purely economic realm. Yes, monopoly. Yes, enormous concentrations of economic power. But when the thing that you are commodifying is humanity itself, the same operations produce new unprecedented concentrations of social power. Ways of shifting key levers in society from people, their communities, their democratic institutions, to the corporations. This begins with, and Jen has already um, begun this discussion, this begins with the production of knowledge itself. We share the fate to live at the dawn of information civilization. That's a world in which if it isn't data, it doesn't exist, right? Like we all have to be represented as data or we're not there. And everything animate, everything inanimate falls to these rules. It's not on the map if it's not data. This is the essence of information civilization. So what, we're, what we all want is an information civilization that advances democracy, that advances equality, that advances the values and principles of individual uh, and collective freedom and the capacity for self-governance, agency, uh, and the, the capacity to live together in self-governing communities. That's what it's all about. But now we have a new institutional order that is usurping the key resources we need for those capabilities beginning with knowledge, because what we have seen over the last 20 years, but um, with incredible aggressiveness and audacity over the last 10, is the concentration of the science and the scientists, all the computational capabilities, and the data inside a very small group of companies, beginning with the big five. And so we have a situation now where 
we understand that these companies control the global market structure of what's being called artificial intelligence, computational knowledge. And in an information uh, civilization, whoever controls knowledge, the future of knowledge, controls the future of society. That's how it works. So once this has been established, we began with the, um, the privacy rights grab. We move on to the control of the production and the application of computational knowledge. And what do we know about knowledge? If we were doing a Rorschach, and I say the word knowledge, the word that should emerge immediately is what? Knowledge produces power. power. Knowledge power, knowledge power. Those figures chasing each other in a Greek vase, which is first, which is second, can't tell. Knowledge power. Inseparable. We're moving forward now in time. We began in the year 2000. We went through the first decade as they're consolidating the capabilities to control computational knowledge. In the second decade, knowledge becomes power. That's where we begin to see that they know so much about us. They perfect the sciences of targeting. Subliminal cues, social comparison dynamics. They know you so well that they know what to present to you and when to get the response that they desire. This starts out, and of course, it's still a little bit crude, but over the course of that second decade, it advances with incredible speed. Why? Because they have the science and the scientists. They've got the machines. They've got the software. We know from a leaked document, Facebook, 2018, what it refers to as its AI hub is able to produce in the year 2018 six million behavioral predictions every second based on ingesting trillions of behavioral data points every day and producing thousands of models every day. That's the scale and scope that we're talking about, unprecedented. So now we've gone from privacy as the foundation, massive scale extraction, knowledge, cornering knowledge, knowledge turns into power, to influence, control, manipulate our behavior, the apotheosis being the 2016 um, presidential elections where um, solid research has shown us that it was Facebook embedded in the Trump campaign that won him the three swing states that won him the presidency by targeting black American citizens in these very specific ways to persuade them not to vote on election day. The black citizens vote went down by 7% that year, something that had never been seen before, and that became the margin that allowed him to win. Migrating from the economic to the political, from economic power to social power, and ultimately, as that social power weakens societies, what we see the companies doing ever more audaciously, month after month, year after year, is their willingness to go head to head with democratic governments to now um, commandeer governance functions, not just privacy rights, but governance functions, migrate those from democratic institutions 
into the zone of the surveillance capitalist institutional order. We saw it in Australia as Facebook and Google went head to head with the Australian Parliament over a new publishing code that would have forced them to pay for um, content that they, that they have on their, on their pages. And Facebook actually chose to take down its pages in Australia at the height of pandemic when people really depended on those information flows rather than bend the knee to the Australian parliament. We saw it in 2020 in Europe where an Apple-Google alliance confronted the work of the European Commission, held hostage its um, uh, uh, mobile communications infrastructure, its ownership of Android and iOS, in order to wrest control over contact tracing and exposure notification from the European Commission and the men member states and put that control under the auspices of Apple and Google um, and, and thus fulfilling their stated goal of eliminating public health authorities' ability to uh, collect data about COVID, the spread of the disease, in order to develop uh, uh, public strategies to contain the uh, to contain the contagion. So there are many examples of this. I'm not going to go into all of them. This is an accretion over time. The earlier achievements create the conditions for the next set of uh, invasion, of rights takeover, of governance takeover, of power takeover. And uh, every new set of takeovers rely relies on uh, what went before. This is how an institutional order builds over time in history. So this is the big picture of how we're now facing not just the Western democracies struggling in this new world of information civilization, but struggling against the intentional objectives of a privately held institutional order that has its own aims and visions for society, which were nowhere better explicated than in the materials produced by sidewalk labs in your great city of Toronto. Voila. Can I pick up on that sidewalk labs example and maybe come back to something that I think Jim's alluded to and you've alluded to as well, Shoshana, which was that fundamentally important role played by civil society. So can we just look at more broadly at areas of intervention? What interventions should be priorities in your view at the moment? And we can start with Jim. Government intervention, civil society intervention, the role of academia. Let's, what are some practical approaches to well, confronting Well, I this? think there's a, a lot that can be done. Uh, uh, the um, civil liberties, the, the CCLA litigated against Sidewalk Lab. So if you're thinking of a charitable donation, you can give them money to use the, the courts to uh, defend. I think many of you were civic actors. Uh, and I, I think that is super critical. Uh, I'm on the board of the Canada School for Public Service and teach there. I think we need higher capacity in, in this civil service, Maya Angelou famously said, when you know better, you do better. And I think you just, in a changed world, you have to give them the tools to, to do what they uh, want to do, or they, they can do. Paul and you are doing a lot of capacity building with your programs and policies and, and Digital Hub. And I do think that the frameworks of the traditional world don't apply anymore, yet we, we haven't quite figured out how the, the new uh, world needs to be because the knowledge enclosure manufactures inequality upstream and it, it generates capital with increasing returns to scale rather than uh, decreasing returns of scale that consumes capital and it breaks the labor capital relationship. So it's manufactured inequality at a system level. Uh, it commodifies a lot of things like natural capital and the human being, 
which we one is a commons, the other is a, an inalienable right or, or should be should be, and, and and these kinds of frameworks lead to strategic behavior, because there's not shared norms around the world, different states, different approaches. We see that in major contention around the world. Uh, it also creates win-law structures between states. And so there really aren't economic alliances anymore. There's security alliances because everybody wants to be the landlord and make the other one the tenant. So there's a huge role of capacity building and education and research. What do we want the new system to look like? So I, I think you need all fronts, but I can't stress enough how disappointed I am in our federal government and how they've responded to the privacy and the, uh, and the AI legislation and how captured it's been by corporate interests. Um, I don't get it other than maybe they get, they're hoping for GR jobs when they're out of politics or policy. I, 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 I just, so I think you gotta call them. And I've been very, very public on this and I'm not a partisan actor. I'm not a member of either party. I don't give them money. Um, but I think, I think you, you need all forces here. And, and as, as Shoshana is talking about, this is, this is a clash of, of, of things that, that I think it's right and wrong. It's, it's inalienable versus uh, theft. Um, and and I, I, think, I think it's at a time where you've got you've to bring every force possible. And of course, there's a lot of you know, gaslighting going on, uh, you know, we'll lose to China, or this is about innovation, or, you know, people have choice here, it's freedom of speech, it's, it's non-censorship. Uh, they, they use all these, and it, they're anything but. But it confuses people, because uh, it, it can be confused. But don't, don't be confused, it's about, it's about rights, it's about a functioning uh, society and economy. And, and fabric, um, and, 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 but, but boy, oh boy, I, I think it's a tug of war. But again, I, I will reiterate, because you mentioned Sidewalk Labs, three levels of government, most powerful company in the world, citizens stood up and, 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 and won. So uh, I'm an optimist on this, and, and I think it's, 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 it needs all, I think it needs all friends. Did you, did you want me to weigh in on that? Or? Well, if you'd like to, yeah. What, what areas of uh, intervention do you I, think are priorities? Very, very simple, I'd like to say. Which is that civil society is not out there. <laughs> Am I right? Yep. It's us. It's right here, right now. In the 20th century, employers had all the rights, property rights. What do people do? They look to the left, they look to the right, they joined hands, they sacrificed, they fought, because they understood that there were two diametrically opposed visions of society, visions of the future, the future for their children and their children's children. We're in that position right now. We are, our conditions of existence have changed. We're not just fighting property rights, we're fighting this accretion of rights that we've been talking about. Economic power, social power, governance power that have been carved out from our lives, carved out from our democratic institutions. But what's similar to the 20th century is we have two opposing visions of the future of society. If you make your money selling predictions, you have a big stake in a society that is optimized for certainty. Behavioral certainty of individuals and of collectives. Your city, your community, your country, your world. It is up to us to decide, are we going to defend democracy, what that means, the idea that human beings should be self-governing, are we going to defend that for another generation? That's up to us now. 
in this decade and in the next, our opportunities will not be endless. Eventually, the opposition will be entrenched so deeply that that fight will become much more violent than it need be today. Today, this group, right now, we're not, it's not a trade union. That was the 20th century. What are we going to call it? Collective action. What are we going to call it? New kinds of groupings in your neighborhood, in your profession, in your workplace, with your friends, whatever it may be. But we need to come together. And we need to be acting on our political system. We need to be acting on our democratic leaders who have caved to this for various reasons over the last 25 years that we haven't gone into yet. But the point is that it's us. It's you and me and us now. And if you want that vision of a democratic future, and if you want that for your children and your families and all of those to come, falls on us right now. Fantastic. That was very powerful from you both. We do have more questions, but I don't want to be that guy that doesn't leave time for questions in the audience and, and online. And I know we have some. So we have Natalie that I know is monitoring some of the online questions. And you've got microphones there. And so we're going we're gonna to open it up. And if there's space, we may come back with some other questions here on the stage. But this is time for you. OK, should we start here on this room? Sign, right side? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Balsili, I checked, and you're apparently 10 years younger than uh, Ms. Zuba. So, uh, so, but this fact about your age was not mentioned in the documentary. Wait, like who is younger? Uh, <laughs> that documentary party about your, you know. Good for me is good for you, so just yeah. draft okay. behind it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Zuboff, so uh, your book, I mean, um, you know, you talk about these like, kind of dangers of the, the privacy like, invasions. And, uh, you know, we all don't want our private data out there, and yet we find these services, you know, we, we use free services, you know, very useful for us, and we keep using them. And I, I guess the definition of privacy is kind of like maybe different between different uh, people and maybe what academic definitions. But, you know, I mean, like, like privacy for most people just, you know, they don't want their friends or family uh, or coworkers to know about something that they did with some other person and not maybe perhaps the government so far away or corporations. I think maybe, I mean, it's a difference between people's stated preferences and their revealed preferences. And people are seem to be all right with these kind of free services. And as far as the kind of uh, remedies, and you know, perhaps something like practical, like um, like you know, no selling of first party data to other companies. You know, you know, no, no, no selling of uh, private data collected by these companies to other companies is all right. Because even if you take out the advertising, this data is still useful to improve the services. I mean, we, we all want a better search engine. We all, we all want a better product. And so this data, even if you take out all the all the you know, capitalism, if you will, is still very useful to improve the services. You know, because these services are based on data rather than you know, like like a kind of like a like a physical thing. Is there a question coming? Uh, yeah. So the question is that because a review of your book that I, I've read mentioned you know kind of little kind of specific uh, remedies or, or like uh, you know actions that you in your book like to take, and I'm wondering if you know as, as a useful remedy if if you could think that you know no selling a first part of data is a useful and the practical step to take, and that's kind of uh, how to kind of to solve it as a, as a way to, you know, this problem. Thank you very much. Can we go to this microphone here for a question? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, hi, thank you so much for your insights. Um, so, Shoshana, your book doesn't get to dive deeper into kind of the issues of generative AI just because it, um, um, what kind of was written before uh, ChatGPT and the whole kind of thing. Uh, something that Tristan Harris from the Center for Humane Technology says is that we shouldn't refer to chatbots as such. And whenever we hear the word chatbot, we should replace it with the word synthetic relationship. And there's also this really um, interesting technology, or sorry, interesting research coming out of Mozilla that talks about um, how these new apps geared towards relationship building that are targeting lonely people are failing 
data privacy um, kind of tests. So I was wondering, in this new age of generative AI and data privacy and black box technology, how are you thinking about um, kind of the future of that? Thank you. We'll take one more online. Sure. So in addition to several questions about what individuals can do to control the role of surveillance capital in their lives while still taking advantage of these services, um, there was also a very interesting question about ethical computation and how can we create or is there a world for ethical computation and how could we incentivize that? Shoshana, would you like to start? All right, well, let, let, let's start with this, um, ethical computation. Here's the thing, and because this relates to, um, I think this is a discussion that relates to uh, all, three, all three of the questions. When we talk about the concentration of the production and application of computational knowledge, okay, this is not an argument that says, we shouldn't have computational knowledge. We shouldn't have data. That train has left the station. We live in an information civilization. The question is, and those of you who know my work will have heard these questions before or read them, not if there's data. The question is, who knows those data? Who has access to that knowledge? Who decides who knows? And who decides who decides who knows? I call these, these are the three questions of knowledge, authority, and power that define what kind of society we are. The tragedy of the concentration of computational knowledge, its production and application in these companies the tragedy is the opportunity cost to global society, all of us. We need those data. We want those data, and guess what? We have a right to those data, because where do they come from? Us. What? Us. Where? Us. us. They come from us, and how do they get them? Stealing. <laughs> Stealing. Stealing. So hold on a sec. They stole it from us. They got it. They concentrated it. They own it. And they're applying it. And what are they applying it to? They're applying it to, for example, if you stay on this web page another 20 Point three seconds, will you buy more stuff later? The application of computational knowledge. How do I get you to make sure you don't vote on election day? The application of computational knowledge that advances the aims of those who own it. Because they stole it. So. What I'm saying is every community and every country on Earth wants data to fix the planet. Let's start with that. To improve health care, cure disease. What about education? Not computers in front of kids, not screens in front of kids, but how about flooding the world with loving, smart people who are going to use data and technology through human relationship, the beauty of teaching and learning how we met each other. That is the most magical relationship in the world. You don't get that from a screen giving a kid a laptop. How do we flood the world with those folks and give them all the resources they need so every child is joyfully educated? That's what we want data for, to fix our infrastructures, every continent in every, in every country. This is what people yearn for. Instead, we have stumbled into what I call an accidental dystopia. This is not the future any of us want. 
So this is not a no to data. This is not a no to information civilization and the wealth of knowledge we can create. This is knowledge from the people, for the people, and we decide. We decide for what purpose. And we, choose the, we are able to choose those purposes that serve our families, that serve the public good, not that further the commercial objectives of these companies. So I think that touches on all three questions. I'll pass That's it over That's good. To you. I'm good. Next question. Thanks, Jim. OK, back to this microphone. All right, not quite on the Over here, Madison. So my question is more, I guess, hello again. <laughs> I know, I have, I have more. Um, so my question is more about regulatory and um, just kind of social concerns. So, you know, it's clear that our data is increasingly more valuable, I guess, than the profits or value we create uh, through working in a, you know, more Western blue collar lens. So big tech, as you say, they access all of our information by stealing. Um, and in the age of rapid technological development, what do we become worth? And specifically, the political and economic sphere that we have right now, we do not have the social safety net to keep us safe from disruptive technology, uh, especially with the US market-driven regulatory approach. Uh, so this is really important because big tech corporations have a techno-optimist view on our philosophy. So where they see pitfalls in the technology they created, they claim that innovation, their technological innovation, will be the solution to the problems that they have burdened on us. So my question is regarding social society groups. I agree, they're so important. Um, but our demands as social society groups, they obliterate the profits that big tech makes. And these corporations are enormous, and such radical calls that I stand for, and I believe you stand for as well, they directly challenge our current capitalist system. And we see this with climate change advocacy groups as well. They try so hard with very little, I guess, progress in the big picture. So how can we become more effective in such a huge capitalist regime? Thanks, Madison. Over here. Uh, thank you for the interesting, insightful discussions. The question is about, um, is there any sort of a historical parallels before the international, uh, internet age about corporate civilians? Because speaking of civilians, you know, I keep thinking, you know, state civilians is sort of a big topic, but it is not new. You know, early, earlier of last century with a, with, a, with a technology like advancement in a fingerprint photo, the state sort of like starts all the civilians. But I, but I kind of think whether is there any corporate civilian activities, you know, before the internet, you know, probably we call it uh, marketing or anything. I just wonder, like, what, uh, what, what are the thoughts uh, of the speaker? Thank you. Thank you very much. Online? Sure. Online, we have a question regarding lessons from the global south and what can we draw in this industrialized world, if that's the term, uh, from the global south when dealing with our version of surveillance capitalism and vice versa. So the relationship with in particular, the global south. Great. Would you like to, Jim? Do you want to start? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think those are extraordinarily good questions. I, I think, in, in terms of will the center hold, I think we're going to have to rethink the system because it it manufactures inequality. And if you notice, coming out of COVID, the U.S. GDP per capita is going up, and Canada is going down, and our policy leaders have a furrowed brow, saying we're flummoxed by this, and yet it's entirely predictable and understanding. You're not participating in the rentier structure of intangibles. And so you, ha you have that, which is symptomatic of the inequality between, well, it's evidence of the inequality between states, and then you have inequalities within society, and, and how do you make this work? So I, I do think your, your comments bear about the power, the distribution, the, the rights, and how are you gonna design societies that that flourish and, and um, nourish. And I believe in capitalism, I believe in innovation, I believe in technology, but these uh, um, 
you have to start to think of the frameworks and the governance and the bo governance and the bo body body politics response to that because you're not powerless in this response, but there is a bit of a learned helplessness in this neoliberal narrative where governments can't do anything and don't have the capacity, and yet we need that more than than ever. And, and I'll just respond to uh, the, just the la last question about when a technology like fingerprints compared to what we have now, when when the when, the, when it's orders of magnitude more powerful, it changes its nature. So uh, there's always, there were pri privacy rights and there was the universal declaration of, or the, the, the privacy after World War II in, in the UN and so on. But, and, and Shoshana deserves enormous credit and she'll probably pick it up from here. But when the nature of the, the technologies and the circumstances changed this much, it's, it, this isn't that anymore. And so you have to start to think of think of these very differently because it's, it's not like a fingerprint what, what's happening now, even though they are privacy and ones, they're both biometrics, but what we're experiencing now, kids' biometrics doing school homework versus somebody getting a fingerprint and filing cabinet 100 years ago, that's, they need very different governance realms. Thank you. Do you want to add any comments, Shoshana? Um, I, I, I think, you know, it's really important to be talking about the global south, and I just make a, a you know, look. Two great continents, Latin America and Africa. Last year at the um, Latin American EU summit, um, leaders from all over Latin America defined their vision of the um, digital future. And their vision was wholly um, data is generated voluntarily uh, by citizens in the context of institutions that they trust uh, because data is used exclusively for the public good um, to advance the kinds of things that we've been talking about, advancing health, advancing infrastructure, advancing education, and so on and so forth. This is, this is the vision, this is the aspiration articulated by leaders in that continent. We look to Africa, we see um, you know, great institutions in the African Union that articulated a vision of the digital future for the African continent. Again, one of uh, data production uh, voluntarily and indeed joyfully joined into, engaged with by citizens uh, for the purposes, again, of applying data for the public good, for um, knowledge and innovation that advances the very concrete needs of societies. Those two continents, right now, each of them, if you saw them on a, uh, a map that um, included underwater, uh, you know, the ability to see deep into the ocean, you would see that each continent sits in a kind of pincer, uh, in, the, in the middle of a pincer movement, because in the case of each continent, Google and Facebook have constructed and deployed uh, the largest undersea cables for d data extraction and transportation that exist anywhere on Earth. Google and Facebook are pretty clear about their bookkeeping for the next generation of business. And it's going to come from sucking data out of those two continents. And yet, um, the people involved in this domain, leaders on those continents, have a very different vision of the future the vision that speaks to what we've been talking about for the last, I don't even know how long it's been, right? So we've got a problem because the expectations of people are going to be contested by the power of this global institutional order that we've been discussing. And its designs, its plans, its vision of the future 
what's going to happen out of that contest? And what's going to happen out of that contest is going to be influenced by what happens out of that context here, beginning in this room, beginning with us, beginning in this community, beginning in all of our communities. What happens here is going to influence the chances of what will happen there. Chances and the opportunities. So, could this be more important? I don't think so. Thank you. I'll mend. And please keep your questions to one sentence, very brief, OK? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so for one sentence, uh, how do we square spreading knowledge and spreading innovation while at the same time restricting it to China? Can we have it both ways, that we want one system here that promotes knowledge freedom while we actively stop it for other countries under intellectual property regime, then the security apparatuses and whatnot? Thank you. Thanks. Tamara? Um, so I'm wondering if you can um, tell us how you see the intersection between surveillance capitalism and Pentagon capitalism, because I think the problem is not just theft, but armed robbery. Um, you know, in the past two decades, we've seen military national security establishment working with big tech in the development of cyber warfare, or cyber weapons, and uh, this was revealed by WikiLeaks and Julian Assange in the Vault 7, and of course the United States is wanting to extradite him um, for, re for revealing this surveillance and war crime. So I would be interested in understanding your, your, how you see this connection between militarism and the surveillance capitalism. Thanks. Online. Thank you, and I understand this is the last question we will have this evening, but could you discuss examples of bias in surveillance capitalism and how that bias may disproportionately affect different demographic groups and how these bi the implications for equity and fairness? How about I take the first one, because that's home plate for me, and you can have the hard ones. Um, oh. um, yeah. the, the, uh, I, I mean, yeah. you ask a very good question on the knowledge enclosure through intellectual property systems and, and all of these compute because it, it mixes in with uh, uh, state security and it also leads to strategic behavior. And so w there was a very recent study that came out that they strongly promoted stronger intellectual property rights in Latin American trade and IP filing soared, but the ownership of all that IP was the incumbent northern uh, actors. And so, in fact, this sort of spreading of knowledge through these frameworks has, in fact, amplified the inequality uh, even amongst allies. So what is the framework for open knowledge? Because we don't have an open knowledge system. We have, we're, the, the, the frameworks are to, to enclose it and, and get a rent for it. And then you intersect with uh, geostrategic behavior with security rivals and everyone's an economic rival. And then what we've talked here is that you're crossing over into elements of social order and social fairness. So my response to that is I think we're going to have a bumpy era. I don't see clarity in this post-neoliberalism, if you want to call it. I think we need scholars. I think we need discourse. I think we need engagement uh, and civil society and all of these things we've talked today. And I don't see clarity. I, I, I see it being bumpier before it gets smoother. How bumpy it's going to get, how long it's going to get, I don't know. But that's why I believe in scholarship, policy development, civil service capacity, civil society engagement. And I'm confident that if those are nourished and brought to the fore, that, that we're, we're going to get it more right than wrong. But I don't have particular clarity how the system's going to work out. From a national point of view, it all roads go to higher capacity and more front-footed approaches and looking after your own sovereign state because nobody's going to do it for you. And, and that's been my national advocacy. But, but in the more global frameworks, I, I believe in the things I just mentioned. But it's a very fair question. That circle does not appear squarable to me right now. And I mentioned the, the contradiction or the paradox of the climate issue. So we, we experienced that in vaccine diplomacy, and I've been saying the IP for vaccines to the south, and I said that's a small 
foreplay compared to what you're going to see from climate technology diplomacy. And, and so I think these frameworks, that's why I always kind of ingest the IP piece into the um, surveillance capitalism. And of course, what's interesting in these learning models is you got a whole new dimension of IP appropriation going on, not just from the individual, but from the copyright structures. And that's, that's 52 pickup on, on the whole global copyright regime. And so again, this is, um, it, it's, it's warring frameworks, it's warring interests. And I cannot see the equilibrium state in it, so I think it's going to be turbulent and and contested for for a while. Shoshana, any reactions to the questions? Um, I'll just um, I'll, I'll take on a, a sliver of the uh, national security um, piece, just because we haven't talked about that um, at all during the session and. Um, and there's an important history there. Um, if you were in Washington, D.C., um, even on uh, September 10th, 2001, and Capitol Hill, uh, the, the discussion about tech and about the internet and about Silicon Valley was a discussion about privacy legislation. Not whether there should be, but how much of what kind and so forth. The next day, September 11th, 2001, everything changed. And according to folks who were there on site, eyewitnesses, within 24 hours, the entire conversation on Capitol Hill did a 180, no more uh, privacy legislation, now the buzzword was total information awareness. And thus begun um, was the uh, national security interest in the baby internet companies, um, Google's still fledgling capabilities in massive scale extraction of human generated data, um, now became a matter of the most urgent national importance. And these priorities were reflected across all of the Western democracies. Oh, hello. And if you, um, and if you uh, research anything about the history of bulk collection, uh, you'll see that um, virtually all of the Western democracies are right up there at the top of the pops. Um, warrantless collection of human-generated data, all triggered by this great shift in our, in our culture around 9-11. Um, what's interesting, because that's a story that we know, what's interesting to me is reading in the national security literature now, one sees a whole new thread emerging. For all of these years, it was the more data we expose, uh, the more data we extract, uh, the better it is for national security, because like, that means that you know, the intelligence agencies have, have insight and opportunities for control and doing the things they do. A new discussion in this literature goes in the opposite direction. And what it's saying now is that we have so overexposed our citizenry, our activities, that this has created a whole new level of vulnerability within our societies. This destruction of privacy, the transfer of privacy into these other zones has left us all naked and vulnerable, and there is no way that the intelligence community offers any protection, even for its own people. So this is very interesting as a dialectic. What was once given the most urgent top priority is now becoming redefined as a very threatening problem. So let's not assume that this all goes one way. 
right? There are now forces coming and voices emerging from within that zone that is saying, hold on a second, the massive scale extraction of human generated data has turned out to be our Achilles heel in the global, um, in the, in the global contest over the future of information civilization. Ergo, Russian interference in our information and communication spaces. Ergo, Chinese interference, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All stories that you've read about, about all things you know something about. So it's complicated, but that dialectic is moving in a direction that has a great deal of meaning for what we can do and what we can achieve. Can we just continue one more bit from both of you? We have many people in the audience today that represent the future generation. If you could offer a last tip out there, what would it be? Shoshana? Well, uh, I know there are a lot of students here, a lot of young people here. Presumably a lot listening, watching. If I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to start with two words. I'm sorry. This mess happened on my watch, happened on our watch, happened on our generations. Are we in the same generation? Yes. I don't think that was clarified. <laughs> it happened on our generation's watch. I'm ashamed. I'm mortified. I've been studying this subject since the year 1978. And most of this elapsed time, I feel like I've been shouting underwater. And maybe if you hear my voice loud and strong now, it's because I've had a lot of practice shouting with no one listening. Things have, the boiling water for us frogs, <coughs> that level has risen. And now people are listening in a way that they didn't 10, 20, 30, dare I say it, 45 years ago. I mean, so, I'm sorry. Look, democracy is not a rock that's there when you're born and is there when you die. It's not the Alps, it's not the Pyrenees, it's not the Rockies. Democracy is a fragile idea. And in every generation, there is a crisis. And sooner or later, every generation is called. Is this important to you or not? Do you believe in self-governance or not? Is it imperfect? Yes. Is it slow and kludgy? Yes. That's what we love about it. Because humans are slow. Humans are complicated. That's what we love about humanity. We're not automatons. If you want this for your future, the ongoing perfectibility that never ends, then it is time for your generation to step up. I'm sorry that it falls on your shoulders. We are going to be with you fighting as hard as we can for as long as we can. And then you have to take it if there is going to be a democratic digital century. It's going to be because of you. Yeah, and, and uh, I would, I, I'm going to echo what Shoshana is, is that learn what to do, do, but then I'm going to say something not to do. Um, uh, what you should do is exactly what she said, is learn and engage, 100%. The one thing I would caution against is buying the gaslighting. They're, they're masters at this game of making you feel like you don't understand. Uh, and I'm gonna give you very clear examples in the AI era. 
the, the idea that they, there's going to be a global agreement. They, remember that UK thing they had where we're all trumpeting and Canada's leading and all that kind of stuff. The idea that something that has win-loss condi conditions that leads to strategic behavior, that you're going to get everybody to come to a global agreement with shared norms on something like this is impossible, or, or that there's going to be a six-month moratorium on coding where we're all going to tape our hands above the table. Or, or the one that's so remarkable is this focus on existential risk, which is, which is unquantifiable, undefinable, and indeterminate. And, and when you don't know somebody's objective, you can look at the outcome and infer it. And when you look at the outcome of all of these activities, the one thing they do is they take you away from taking near-term action at the, at the current elements. And that is the objective of all this, is a bird feigning a broken wing to take you away from the nest. So I 100% support what uh, um, Shoshana is advocating for, obviously. Um, beware um, the gaslighting and, and its effects because you have way more power than you realize. It's just an effort to convince you you don't understand and to go over some, some place where you don't exercise it. But I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an optimist. I always believe. <laughs> That's what I love about you, Jim Vasile. <laughs> well, take back the night. Thank you so, so much to both Professor Shoshana Zuboff and Mr. Jim Balsili for providing such insightful and hugely intellectually informed remarks on an era of what you both describe as surveillance capitalism, something that in your presence and through your uh, authorship, I and many others in the room today have learned a great deal about. On behalf of President Paul Sampson and CG and the Balsillie School of International Affairs, thank you so much for coming to Canada and for coming down the road, Jim, <laughs> and sharing your knowledge with us today. Join us in... As a final thank you, Jim, Shoshana, again on behalf of CG and the BSIA, we'd like to offer you, oh, thank you. this local oh. gift. Is there food in here? No. There might be. <laughs> might be a little snack. Um, as you. a token of our appreciation for your time, for your contribution to the public discourse, and for the conversation today. Thank, thank you. Thank you to you, thank you to the audience, and we will now close the meeting. Thank you. Thanks.